well hello book nerds welcome to the book nerds podcast uh, it's an amazing weekend uh, yesterday we were discussing about homi bhaba and today you know we have we are in a completely different direction we are going to talk about this amazing one once in a lifetime book i must tell you that uh, it's called vyas katha uh, fables from the mahabharata uh, by nityanand misra who is with here today uh, thank you sir for doing this thank you for taking time out a pleasure nice to be on book nerds thank you so much and you know i was reading the book and i was like okay this is a lot of hard work i have i have interacted with a lot of authors i have talked about research i have talked about homework do they get time to write or not but this is a lot of homework if and we'll ask you more about that but before that let me tell uh, all the yeah. readers who will be watch yeah <laughs> i'll i'll just quote a semi verse uh, in sanskrit yeah. it goes sure vidvaneva vijanati vidvat jana parishramam it's only a scholar who knows yes. how much hard work a scholar has done so you know oh my just... gosh thank you thank you thank you <laughs> for the love of you <laughs> but you know I, i i must say that you are very kind but uh, i would say you know uh, it takes a lot and we'll talk in detail about this how this came about the book came about and uh, but before that i need to tell everyone about uh, you a little bit because you have a bio to i mean it's it's ridiculous okay so i have to you know read it out because usually what i do is i just ramble the bio i remember it but this one it is quite uh, eclectic i must say uh, so uh, nityanand misra is an alumnus of iim bangalore uh, 2007 and gujarat university he has worked for more than 14 years in the investment banking sector what's happening here investment banking and uh, you know a book like this i am just so happy to see this um outside work of course uh, he is a multifaceted uh, personality a polyglot a grammarian um, we always love those kind of people at book nerds uh, we are in particular grammar nazis uh, so we really love people like that a literature and uh, an instrumentalist a, a musicologist a researcher and editor an author and a book designer okay yeah, i think i think you belong at book nerds you have to be here right? <laughs> so um, of course uh, we go on he is also a professional on a mastician providing consultation on sanskrit names to parents and businesses very interesting uh, uh, sir is passionate about indic culture especially classical and medieval literature music and arts an initiated uh, disciple of swami ramabhadra acharya uh, he is a self taught scholar of sanskrit that's amazing sir it's you know it's very tough to kind of you know uh, teach uh, yourself a language and that to sanskrit we'll ask you more about that um vyas katha of course is uh, his seventh book uh, he writes on indic religions scriptures philosophy culture and names he lives in bombay and with his family uh, okay i'm out of breath so i need to you know kind of relax for a bit and then ask you this is again i would like to show the cover again and then i'll ask you the question okay this is a lot of work how does one kind of you know take all this material first of all read it and not just read it you have to kind of marinate in this if if the analogy is uh, could be right and then of course take parts and then come up with these fables which would be relevant for adults and children especially uh, they have to be very relevant for children because that's the time where you know morals can come to the fore and we don't even know right i mean we we learn in school but later on in life we are like okay uh, that teacher that principal taught me these morals uh, that book where i read a fable that these are impressions right uh, so tell us a little bit about how this entire process an epic in itself if i can call it that happened uh, you mean how i came to write this book right oh yes yes yeah uh mahabharata you know all of us know about it some of yeah. us have watched it on tv some of us, a lot of us have watched it on tv yeah. some of us have uh, read the original some of us have read yeah. translations yeah. now what happens is uh, 
the main focus of the epic is the battle between the Pandavas and the Kauravas. Right. Uh, but that's not the only narrative in the Mahabharata. There are so many right. other kathas, as we call them, or upakathas. Uh, yeah. uh, and among them are these fables. There is no equivalent word for fable in Sanskrit. The, the umbrella term is a katha. Uh, and we can call fables as niti katha, or moral stories. Uh, in English, we define a fable as a story or a narrative with yeah. non-human characters uh, and a moral. Now, this is something which makes it very interesting, especially for children. We all know we have heard fables in our childhood, like uh, uh, the, the the lazy camel or you know the three fish or uh, the case of sour grapes. And we know these stories. We we heard them in childhood. We learned something from them, and we carry yeah. carry those learnings uh, in our life. Uh, so, the 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 art of fables, the art of narrating fables, originated from India. Yeah. Uh, they were Aesop's fables, but yes, there are fables found in the Upanishads and the Brahman Granthas of the of the Vedic texts. Yeah. So, it's here that we perfected this art: the Panchatantra, the Hitopadesha, the Jataka. We all know about them. However, fables in the Mahabharata, if you say, people don't know, people are not aware. Because that's yeah. they're scattered all over the epic, narrated yeah. by different characters at different points in the narrative of the epic. So yeah. this was something which was not widely known. Yeah. Plus, there are these fables are, are, some of them are also narrated again in the Panchatantra or the Hitopadesha. Some of them are similar to some Jataka fables. So uh, I thought that, why not write something about fables in the Mahabharata, yeah. which not many people know about, and uh, provide the context, provide the learnings, and uh, and package it as a book. So that's how yeah. this idea came about. I originally thought about this in 2016 uh, okay. and came up with a list of stories I wanted to write about in 2017, but somehow didn't get time to write the book. Then finally, four years later, uh, there was time and so i said okay let's write this book and that's how it yeah. happened <laughs> yeah i mean uh, you know there's a publisher's note at the beginning of the book and i would like to show it to everyone it's it's ba it basically says that uh, you know uh, uh, while some portions of a few kathas in this book may not resonate with modern readers uh, all the kathas are unabridged translations and have stayed true to the original text um what is the publisher hinting at? Because, you know, first of all, shout out to Bloomsbury. They are great. Uh, they have let us, they have let us do this. But uh, what, what's with this, the modern reader? Uh, what are they hinting at? I, I don't know exactly because uh, this is not, is from the publisher. It's kind of a disclaimer that you have uh, in every, most, most of the books carry this on the copyright page. Like all the views expressed are of the, uh, of the author alone, so I guess it's it's kind of a, a legal process where a legal team advises that since oh. some portion may be considered objectionable by some readers, so let's oh. let's put this note. Okay. Uh, okay. However, as we have said, these are faithful and unabridged translations of yeah. the stories or fables in the Mahabharata. So yeah. even if somebody finds it uncomfortable that yeah. uh, a specific portion, I think. Uh, in our uh, in our effort, we have to maintain the original intent of the Mahabharata. Right. For right. example, let's say filial values, a, a brother sacrificing his uh, good for his uh, gain for somebody else's, or yeah. the devotion of a wife to, to the husband, which is in the fable of the pigeons. Now, there right. are some dialogues there, which are, of course, every, every work is a product of its times. So people reading Good. today may find it Okay, this is outdated, but yeah. that was what the Mahabharat. Uh, that is what the Mahabharat yeah. says, and that is what was written then. So that's uh, I, I believe that's uh, a kind of a, a legal uh, disclaimer that publishers put right. out either on the copyright page or as a note. Oh yes, and I was talking to uh, the publisher at uh, uh, ACK, and uh, I, it was kind of something like this which we were discussing, and th there there are some people who say that you know. This is obsolete. This is, you know, we are in modern times and perhaps people look at things 
I mean, I think we are over progressive, uh, to be honest. But uh, you know, uh, at this point of time, we are over progressive. But you need to. You are so right that you need to look at the context of it all. Uh, when this was, you know, uh, written or you know, told, uh, there is too much context to. So you have to read the entire book also, guys. You know, overall, and then understand the context. And let's talk about structure on that count. because the structure is very interesting in the fables some of them are short some of them are you know uh, longer but it's tell us a little bit about the structure because i found it very interesting it it was like it was breaking it down very easily for someone like me who can always come back every day to read a couple you know right i'll read a couple uh, get my you know daily dose of gyan and then go back and then come back to it so tell right. us a bit about that so uh, uh if you compare the mahabharata the fables in the mahabharata to other works like panchatantra or hitopadesha or even the jataka the panchatantra is a book only on neeti kathas or fables or moral stories so you know this is only about moral stories or the hitopadesha or even the jatakas uh, in the jataka kathas there's also a buddhist touch to it like uh, there's a bodhisattva and so right. the ultimate uh, message is not just a moral learning but also praising the bodhisattva or the buddha yeah. uh, however they're all together in the mahabharata because the fables are scattered all over told by different characters at different point of uh, points of time for example the fable of the the crow and the swans yeah. that has been narrated by shalya on the 17th day of the kurukshetra war to right. demoralize karna as we know in the mahabharata yudhishthir had requested uh, shalya to perform tejo vadha the murder of spirit of uh, yeah. karna and yeah. that's that's a fable he used to do that uh, so every fable if we just narrate the fable it's not going to help i thought yeah. giving it ample context like the the prologue yeah and the epilogue who has narrated this fable in what context in response to what question and the epilogue what happened as a result of the narration of the fable did a change of heart happen or something else happen uh, what were the implications that was the context plus i thought maybe we should elaborate a bit on the learnings and how these learnings are corroborated by other indian literary traditions for example uh, the fable of the two sisters the snakes and the hawks where kadru and vinita have a bet so the learning the one of the learnings from the fable is that gambling is a vice and one should stay away from it so i thought why not corroborate this learning with what other texts say on gambling for example the kamandakiya neeti sar other works similarly uh, at some places i have said okay the panchatantra on this topic says this the hitopadesh says this in the ramayana this is what is said in the oral literature for example abdur rahim khana khanas gives this nugget of wisdom uh, that one should not go uninvited anywhere so yeah uh, in a way to reflect what the mahabharata has taught and reinforce it with what other texts have taught that's the learning and then some places i provided a trivia for example uh, there's a fable on the four beaters the beaters and uh, there are names of these beater nestlings and these names are the names of four rishis in a sukta of the rigveda which is devoted to agni so this is a a very intelligent composition by the author or the narrator of the of the fable who has yeah. imagined or who has represented those four rishis as a beater nestlings so that trivia gives additional insights about the fable and every fable in my book has this structure a prologue the the fable itself or the katha the epilogue the learnings and and trivia for some fables it 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 makes the book very easy to you know kind of consume uh, because right. you know i mean obviously most of us don't get time to read a book you know um, i mean i do it because i do it professionally but you know uh, otherwise casual readers will mostly kind of come in and go so that ways the structure worked for me really worked for me and this is a book which you can read in any order you can read 
start to ah, it you can read yeah. from number 51 to 1 you can read number yeah. 27 yeah. first and number 23 later yeah. so that's how i intended the structure to be so that yeah. people can can maybe read the shorter fables bef- uh, right. before they read the longer ones and so on yeah also also a great book for you know new readers uh, i mean obviously i i don't think so many people are going for the entire text the epic te- text these days so it's kind of you know growing into it perhaps if i can call call it that perhaps you get you know inspired by some of the fables then go to the text and check out the text and then come back you know so right. it's a great thing you know i mean it's a great job uh, honestly let's get right into the fables now um sure. uh, we were discussing earlier which one to go for uh, uh, would you like what would you like to pick first uh, i would love you to read uh, one and then we'll go for the others i mean you'll discuss we'll go with your, we'll go with your choice rohan <laughs> <laughs> the king and the bird then the king and the birds uh, was one of my the, favorites so the first first one or the second one the first the same the one one first one, first one right yeah. okay so let's see uh, it's not too long we can read uh, now this is a uh, narrated by uh, when yudhishthir when arjun has gone to swarga yudhishthir and yeah. the draupadi and the, the other brothers they reach uh, yamuna and that's when uh, lomash says that this is the spot where king ushinara had uh, performed a yajna and his glory had exceeded even that, that of the gods and so then he narrates lomash rishi narrates this fable to uh, yudhishthir once indra and agni went to ushinara's dev like assembly or divine assembly to test the great king the boon granting gods or devas wanted to know mahatma ushinara indra and agni transformed into a hawk and a pigeon respectively and made their way to ushinara's yajna the pigeon out of fear of the hawk reached the king's lap and sought his refuge afflicted by fear he hid himself there the hawk said o king all kings say that you are the one and the only dharmatma the one who is steeped in dharma or one who is a, a very righteous person why do you want to do something that is against all dharmas or against all righteousness or against all that is good the pigeon is ordained to be my food i am troubled by hunger do not protect him out of a desire to achieve dharma you have given up dharma by sheltering him the king said o oh great bird he is scared from head to toe he is afraid of you and wants my protection desirous of saving his life this bird has come to me if i do not hand over to you this pigeon who has come here seeking his safety it is the supreme dharma o oh hawk why do you not realize this o oh, hawk the pigeon appears to be agitated trembling with fear he wants to live and so has come to me um, ab- abandoning him would be reprehensible one who kills brahmins one who kills a cow the mother of the world and one who abandons a refugee their papa or transgression is comparable the hawk said o oh, king all creatures are born only due to food they grow by food and live by food alone it is possible to live for a long time even after abandoning wealth which is difficult to let go of however it is not possible to live for long after giving up food o oh, king now that i have been deprived of my food today my five pranas or my life will leave my body and go where there is no fear o oh, dharmatma when i am dead my children and wife will also perish a dharma that conflicts with another dharma is no dharma it is rather kudharma or bad dharma o king of true valor the dharma that follows from no such conflict is the true dharma o protector of the earth one should assert in the greater and smaller good among conflicting dharmas and follow that dharma where there are no obstacles o king considering the greatness and smallness of actions in determining what is dharma and what is adharma a certain dharma to be there 
where the good is greater. So the hawk is trying to convince the king to yeah. let go of the pigeon. Yeah. And he's he's arguing from a very uh, very wise perspective. Yeah. The king said, Oh, excellent bird, your words are very beneficial. Are you Garuda, the king of birds? No doubt, you know dharma. And as you as you speak words of dharma at length and wonderfully, there's nothing that is not known to you. This is how I see you. How do you consider forsaking a refuge seeker as correct? O oh, traveler of the skies, this effort of yours is for food. And it is possible to arrange even more food for you by any other by other means. A bull, a boar, a deer, a buffalo, or anything else that you may want here. Let it be arranged for you today. The hawk replied, Maharaja, I will eat neither a boar nor a bull, nor animals of various kinds. What use do I have with anything else? Oh, the best among Kshatriyas, it is this pigeon that was ordained by the gods for me, by the devas for me. O oh, protector of the earth, please leave him for me. A hawk feeds on pigeons. This is the eternal law. O oh, king, do not take the support of a banana trunk without knowing its strength. This is an idiomatic expression. It says, do not yeah. uh, stand on weak footing. The king said, O traveler of skies, I shall give you the prosperous kingdom of the Shibis. Or, O hawk, I shall give you every object that you desire, except for this bird. O hawk, who has come to me seeking my refuge. O the best of birds, tell me, what action of mine will make you leave this bird? I shall do that, but I will certainly not give you this pigeon. The hawk said, King Gushinara, if you have affection for the pigeon, then cut off your flesh, weighed in a balance against the pigeon. O oh, the best of kings, when your flesh weighs the same as the pigeon, then give it to me. That will be to my satisfaction. The king said, O oh, hawk, I consider it to be a favor that you ask me like this. Therefore, I will now give you my own flesh, weighed in a balance. The king, who knew the supreme dharma, then cut off his own flesh and weighed it against the pigeon. When the pigeon was weighed, he was heavier than the flesh. King Gushinara then repeatedly cut more flesh from his body and offered it. When the flesh did not weigh as much as the pigeon, then, with all his flesh having been cut, King Gushinara himself climbed on the balance. Then the hawk said, O knower of dharma, I am Indra. This pigeon is Agni. Desirous to know your dharma, we both arrived at this place for Yajna. O king, as you cut parts of your own flesh from your limbs, this brilliant glory of yours will surpass all others. O king, as long as humans will speak about you in this world, your fame and lokas will stay permanent. After speaking thus to the king, Indra once again ascended to Swarga with Agni. The righteous or the dharmatma Ushinara spread dharma both on the earth and in Swarga. Later, the resplendent king also ascended to Swarga with his body. Of course, uh, I mean, this, um, the fable is so relevant in contemporary times. I mean, it's quite, you know, quite something. Uh, still, uh, there's a war going on in Russia and Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah. Millions of refugees have fled Ukraine. Yeah. What do other countries do? What does Poland do? What does Germany do? We are all uh, we are all inspired by these countries who haven't thought about their good or bad, but they have just sheltered those millions of refugees right. who have run away from Ukraine. Yeah. So the fable teaches that if somebody yeah. comes to you for shelter for your refuge. It's the foremost duty of anybody to protect yeah. that, to offer them food, to offer them shelter, to offer them a place of safety. And this is relevant today. This will be relevant tomorrow. This will be relevant at all times. Yeah. So, I mean, you're so right. And, you know, it. it is very funny that when, you know, I come across people who are like, I mean, you know, there are some people who just, you know, take it easy. Like this knowledge right here. 
uh, and which has been kind of you know uh, the author has worked hard on you know kind of uh, making the format such that it's easy to consume people just you know okay it's it's not so relevant because we are too busy and we can't see uh, we can't see closely so that's why this one was my favorite because it was so relevant uh, also not that others aren't but this just struck because of the uh, factors that you have mentioned uh, especially the war okay I, I know we decided that you know we should take the questions at the end C can we take a couple because oh, i think well, some people are kind of you know asking so let me go okay I, uh, okay ravi gore let me show question ravi gore question i read this i read the story in my school but the king name was given Raja Shibi, are they both the same? Uh, yes. So there is another fable in the Mahabharata with the name as Shibi, and uh, that is also in this book. Now, in the Mahabharata, uh, we come across three such fables. In one of them, it is Shibi. In one, it is it is Ushinara, and in another one, it is I, I don't remember the name right now. Uh, yeah. And uh, at one place, it is said that these two two of these persons were the same. So uh, it's right. It is uh, the same story that you heard. Thank you, Ravi, for the question. Uh, let's go to go to another one. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, Devika is asking, why would you recommend reading mythological fiction? Um, it's kind of related. Uh, would you like okay. to take that one? Uh, sure. Uh, I use the term Puranic or Aetihasic fiction, or or mm -hmm. not even fiction. I just uh, use the word are Puranas. Yeah. Now. Right. Uh, even if you think that these are imaginary, even if you think that these are fables, or even if you think about the Mahabharata or the Ramayana or Puranas as imaginary, there's so much to learn because uh, they they give us such a great understanding of human behavior and human uh, thought process. Yeah, it's not for it's not for no reason that the Mahabharata is one of the most popular literary works ever written down anywhere in the world because the the people there, you see, you look at different characters, look at Duryodhana or Yudhishthira or uh, Draupadi, and there's so much human understanding, you can relate to them. So uh, why, why do I recommend reading such works? Because there's so much to learn, that's all. <laughs> Thank you so much, Devika, for your question. Uh, I hope the author has answered it for you. And uh, also, I, I was really fascinated. Of course, you did not perhaps... I, let let me ask you first um there is some amazing artwork in the book and you know um is it because uh you want the children to kind of imbibe this or what was the thought process behind this let me let me show it to uh, everyone so you know uh there is artwork in uh you know with 25, the, 25 illustrations is one yeah yeah you know, it's beautiful. Uh, te uh, tell us, you know, how this process worked because it's kind of a collaborative process. It's like, you know, the illustrated children's books, a kind of the, that format. But uh, here there are fables. So how does it work? You know, how does the format uh, come up? Yes. Now, uh, I wanted these illustrations to be in color. Okay. Unfortunately, okay. unfortunately, the publisher rules very thought that uh, this would uh, this would be more expensive then. Uh, I know, but I know. all yeah. all these twenty five illustrations inside the book are in color. Yeah. They are all uh, oil on canvas, yeah. uh, around three feet by five feet, or some are even bigger. And wow. uh, what uh, the the artist Shivani Atri, how she worked on these uh, was, I would send the translation and the original uh, text. So okay. my, my translation and the original text, and okay. then she would compose it in her mind. And then okay. I would identify one verse from the fable okay. to be written as part of the painting or the illustration. Right. So uh, we, uh, we try to be as faithful to the original text as possible. For example, if you look at uh, the Rishi and the insect, I yeah. think it's number. Uh, uh, what's the page number? The Rishian is three sixty one. Fable number forty five. Three sixty one. Okay. 
So here's an illustration which shows Vyasa and an insect. And there are, uh, there's a bullock cart in the background, the yeah. multiple people. So yeah. uh, why, why do we have four oxen there? Because the text, talk, text talks about plural when it yeah. refers to oxen. Why do we have three men there? Because the text talks in the plural when, when it has three right. men. Why do we have an insect there and not a worm? Because uh, the, the text says that the keto was running right. fast yeah. on the road. So we, we tried to stay as faithful to the text as possible. Of course, there are some creative liberties which are involved in right. any uh, work of art. So that's what the artist has taken. And even the cover page has been uh, done by the same artist. So uh, I wanted them to be rich in color. And uh, these illustrations are interesting for children, but also because we have incorporated verses, original verses from the text. So yeah. uh, even adults can appreciate uh, this art. So yes, it was to make the book more interesting. A book yeah. on fables has to have illustrations. Uh, oh, yes. 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 So yeah. Also, the, the format could have been uh, quite different as well. It could have been. Uh, perhaps lesser text and more illustrations. Uh, did you think about that also? I think was that, uh, yes. Uh, so uh, what I wanted this book to be was uh, a reading, which is a faithful and unabridged translation of these stories. Now, right. we are thinking of some derivative works, which are works which are simplified versions of these fables where we have more illustrations. That could be targeted at... Uh, children of younger age. This book as such can be read by teens, can be read by adults. And for young children, you need a, somebody to read it to them, like a parent and to ex, uh, to read and explain it to them. So uh, yes, it's a it's a trade off that you have to uh, undertake. Uh, if, if it's heavy on the illustrations, then uh, you have to make the language far simpler than what is used in my book, uh, yeah. as that would be targeting a very young audience. Uh, this book as such is for uh, teens, young adults, and uh, uh, parents, grandparents who want to read it to their children. Yeah. Uh, there's another one which is very interesting. It's uh, less of a question, but uh, I really wanted to pop this up. Uh, Mahabharata is a lesson in life and management as far as I'm concerned. And, uh, you know, you, uh, Bala is saying uh, that, uh, you know, you have consulted businesses also and you know i don't know in what detail and what happens there but uh, what is uh, what is the relevance there because it is hard for corporates to sometimes understand you know they they will say the right thing perhaps that it will be a learning it could be a great you know activity but do they really want to imbibe could you can you shed some light on that uh I cannot speak about the businesses if they want to imbibe or not. But if uh, they uh, if, if they really want to imbibe or not, but uh, if they have if they want to learn, there's so much from the Mahabharata, like yeah. strategy, comparative strategy. Yeah. You uh, uh, or you know uh, politics. How to there's a, there's a, such a great fable on uh, the the rivers and the ocean, which teaches yeah. us that it is not the best idea to strike back immediately when somebody or something strikes you. Right. The better strategy is to wait for the right moment and the right time and then show your power. So right. a lot of times we see this, we see this everywhere, you know, like, uh, like in, uh, even in cricket, is it yeah. wise to just go after the baller like Amir Sohail did uh, uh, yeah. for Vinkitesh Prasad? Or you want to aggressive, you want to show your aggressive behavior at the right time, at the right uh, opportunity. So there are so many lessons for businesses, for politicians, and uh, for even people who are, are dealing with their, you know, uh, the, the moral element. So uh, it all boils down to the word niti. Uh, as you know, I've wrote, I, I've written in my um, preface, and I'd like to read this out. Uh, yeah, sure. There is a, it's somewhere, I think, yeah, it's, uh, sorry, give me a moment. 
Yes, so it's it's on page two. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, there is no English equivalent of the Sanskrit word niti, and this panchatantra, hitopadesha, jataka, to to some extent jataka, and the, these fables in the Mahabharata are works of niti. What is niti? Niti is guidance, management, moral, practical, or political wisdom, proper or wise conduct, prudence, right course. Policy, etc. These are all meanings of niti. And uh, Arthur Ryder, in when he translated the Panchatantra, he had he had uh, written, and I quote: uh, "Western civilization must endure a certain shame in realizing that no precise equivalent of the term niti is found in English, French, Latin, or Greek." This is an English person saying the saying uh, uh, this about niti. So this overarching concept of niti. Policy, conduct, management, uh, moral. This is what this book is about. This is what uh, the Panchatantra is about. This is what the Hitopadesha is about. And all these stories uh, teach us some small nuggets of wisdom, which we can apply at various points in our life, uh, at businesses, you know, in politics, in our day-to-day -day life, and so on. Yeah. I I certainly think that everybody you know reads these texts uh, and. Of course, I, I would recommend uh, read all the authors to get kind of a, a wholesome sort of, you know, yeah. view. And that's always great, you know, instead of just following one author blindly, it would be like, you know, it would be a great platter uh, if you would do yeah. that. Uh, let's go to uh, Fable 39. It's called The Devoted Parrot. Yeah. And uh, again, my favorite uh, because, you know, the moral here was just... Uh, yeah, very relevant again. Uh, also, it touched upon something that is very close to me, the environment. So it was it was something, uh, a good concoction, I would say. So tell us a bit about this one. Uh, what can people kind of take away from here? Yeah, so uh, the fable in uh, brief is that uh, uh, there's a parrot who lived uh, in the hollow of a tree and... Uh, there's a hunter who has a poisoned arrow. He shoots it at a deer, misses the mark, the arrow strikes the tree, and because there's poison in the arrow, uh, the tree withers, the leaves drop, and all the birds leave the tree. And there's one parrot who does not leave the tree. And then um, Indra, the king of the gods, is impressed. Oh, wow, this is, uh, this is something I've never seen. Uh, here's a parrot who's... Uh, who doesn't leave his home, even though it's uh, it's burnt, not burnt, but it's 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 destroyed. Uh, it's about to die. So uh, Indra comes to uh, the parrot and says, uh, "Why don't you leave this tree? Uh, there's so many other trees uh, which offer shade. with so many birds. Uh, there's fruits, and uh, you can live a life." And what the parrot says is very touching. The parrot says that uh, this is this is where I grew up. Uh, this is the tree where I was born, where I acquired noble virtues, where I was sheltered with filial affection, and where I was never harmed by enemies. I am intent on compassion. Uh, I am a devotee of this tree, and uh, I do not want to go anywhere else. So the parrot has a sense of gratefulness that this is this tree gave me shelter. This is where I grew up, and how can I leave it? And this is such a touching story that touches all of us. We, at some point of time in our life, we always have this uh, sense of belonging. Where do we belong? Uh, our hometown, our parents. And this is especially, uh, this will especially resonate with people who have left their home, who have not yeah. had the luxury to, you know, work where they were born, who have left their home, left their place of schooling, left their yeah. parents to earn a bread or to earn yeah. livelihood. And then uh, they always keep thinking about them. So we carry I our parents, that. our home, our school with us. And Where were you born? Where were you born? Where, where did you go to school? I was born in Lucknow. I oh, went to school wonderful. In yes, uh, great. Uh, second home, second home to me. Uh, brilliant. I, I would go in detail, uh, but you know, we'll be then talking only about Lucknow. But because you know, I love it yeah. so much. <laughs> so you were born there. Which school was it? 
Uh, no, I was born in Lucknow, and then because okay. my father was uh, a scientist with the Indian Council for Agriculture Research, uh, okay. he had different locations. So I was in Meerut earlier. I went to okay. Dayavati Modi Academy there, but uh, just just class one, and then I was in Junagarh where I went to Kendri Vidyalaya. Okay, yeah. So it, it it's so relevant to you, right? I mean, the sense of belonging. You know, it's yeah. so. It. I always say this to my team also: the sense of belonging. uh and uh, some of them may be watching uh the sense of belonging there there was this brother in our school his name was brother dominic and in all moral lectures every week for one hour he would talk about sense of belonging again and again i had never understood what he was trying to say you know but you have mentioned it right now and it all comes back you know how it's so important uh please go on i you know for example uh, let's say let's say uh um uh, today if something happens uh, in uh, where i was born or where i studied i want to know what happened and if something sad happens there i will feel sad a part of me will feel sad if something if if the home where i grew up even though i don't live there if yeah. uh, well uh, god forbid if there's a flood or a fire and that place is destroyed even though nobody lives there anymore you you do feel sad about it and yeah. the fable the fable uh, the lesson of the fable is that it's compassion which is which is essentially a human value and yeah. the medium is the fable is teaching this through a parrot so yeah. the 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 message is that here in a story a parrot can be so compassionate so why can't humans be compassionate right it's right. it's a very deep lesson that uh what and what is what is this compassion which is called anrishamsya in sanskrit so yeah. it is uh, the quality of being pained because of another's pain when we see somebody else in pain we feel that pain and this is what's this is what's on display for the ukrainian refugees today yeah we feel their pain we yeah. there are people who are welcoming them with messages in english and ukrainian this is yeah. happening in poland which doesn't speak english or ukrainian there are right. people who are welcoming them in germany there are people who are providing them shelter so this compassion of feeling pain for somebody who's in pain that is yeah. an essential uh, lesson from this fable and this is this, this without this compassion what will happen in this world everybody to feed for themselves everybody to fend for themselves uh, it will be a very bad place to live in so i know i know and you know i just got goosebumps you know all over it's not even cold here it's it's there a dune but it's not cold yeah i just got goosebumps because it is the truth empathy compassion it has to be there and you know you have uh, mentioned the war a couple of times and it is so relevant right now that we are having this discussion let's go to another question uh, sure. uh it's by sneha how important is the knowledge of vedas and upanishads and i read a book i think so by daji and it's by westland books and mm -hmm. it, it was about this and it was also kind of uh not a similar format but not exactly but kind of similar uh so tell us uh, i mean would you like to take that one yes so if uh, if you if you're thinking from a monetary perspective how important is you know engineering and medicine versus knowledge of vedas no it will not give you money it will not it will not give you a job but to understand uh indic culture to understand hinduism Uh, the vedic culture and the philosophy of the upanishads on which you know uh, the bhagavad gita is based or to learn about the human mind and uh, to learn about the history of this great country it is important to to have a knowledge of uh, the vedic and the upanishadic texts and the, a follow up question to that does it give us an edge uh, somehow knowledge, does it knowledge, an edge knowledge. knowledge always gives you an edge okay the more the more you know the the sharper you are so <laughs> great i can see and we haven't discussed the multifaceted you uh, but you know learning a lot of i mean you are a poet I'll, i'll give you i'll give you an example uh, i consult yeah. on names and uh, okay. i specialize in sanskrit names okay uh, i know the language well enough uh, I, i don't claim to be a pandit but i know it well enough to comment on names to discuss names and to translate and i'm still learning now does it give me an edge 
in any interview, when I'm interviewing people for my team or in any interaction, uh, if somebody tells me their name, I just tell them some small detail about it. And I think it's a great icebreaker. You meet a person and they tell me, okay, my name is uh, Sahadeva. And I say, oh, do you know? Do you know there's one in Mahabharat, but do you know there's one in the in the Vedic texts also? And that's uh, the thing after whom Sahadeva was named. Or, you know, uh, Pathikrit. Somebody tells me their name, Pathikrit. Oh, do you know this is the name of Indra in the uh, in the Vedic texts? And this means that. So it's a great idea. It gives me an edge in interpersonal uh, relations, in, uh, in, in having a conversation. So uh, knowing, knowledge never killed anybody, you know. So... Right. <laughs> No, you're so right. I mean, it, it actually matters, you know, when you, uh, I, I mean, people appreciate that you know the meaning of the name. Let's let's call it that. It is, I have seen it so many times. So, yeah, uh, I think Anuba comments on that. She says, knowledge always gives you an edge. So true. So, yeah, she, she appreciates that. Um, Thank you. Also, yeah. Uh, one more question was there. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you want to take this one, uh, <coughs> Arshi is asking, uh, Vyas Katha is a fable of tales among the tales in Mahabharat and each tale depicts the Hindu thoughts, philosophies and wisdoms. How far do you relate to these philosophies? I mean, as much as, as I know uh, uh, the author now, I think he relates, but would you like to take this one? Uh, yes, there's less of philosophy. There's philosophy in some fables, but more of niti, which is, uh, you know, wisdom or uh, tact or policy or conduct. Uh, do I relate to these philosophies? Yes, I do. Uh, I I do read the Bhagavad Gita, which is a part of the Mahabharata, and uh, I, I deeply believe in it. So uh, as a person, I do believe in the philosophy. It resonates with me. Uh, but... Uh, even if you do not subscribe to this philosophy, there's so much to learn from the Mahabharata. There's so much to learn on the other aspects. So philosophy is something which, you know, you may be, you may be a Buddhist, you may be a Muslim, you may be a Christian, but still you could learn so much from the Mahabharata. So uh, in, that, in that respect, these fables are uh, for everybody, for even those who subscribe to this philosophy or not. Brilliantly answered, I must say. You are a polyglot, and would you like to tell us uh, which uh, languages do you, uh, you know, uh, speak or write in? Would you like to tell us? And sure. I have a follow-up question to that. Sure. So, starting with the uh, mother tongue, Hindi. Uh, yes. English, yes. Sanskrit. Right. These three languages I write in. Uh, okay. I I can speak Gujarati. I grew up in Gujarat, so I speak Gujarati. Uh, not as a native speaker, but I can understand it perfectly. I can carry out a uh, full conversation. I learned basic German, so I can okay. carry on a basic conversation in German. I understand okay. Marathi, uh, trying okay. to learn it now. I understand bits of Kannada, can manage a few phrases. And wow. uh, uh, Avadhi is something I understand from the Ramacharitra Manasa. So I would say these five or six yeah. languages is what I know. I can write in, in three uh, hopefully, I'll write in more in future. But as of now, yeah. uh, three other languages, uh, English, Hindi, and Sanskrit, which I know well enough to write books in. Right. What about translations? What is your opinion on that? Uh, because, uh, you know, of course, all this has been kind of, you know, translated. Uh, is What about the essence of it? Uh, because you, are, you can write also in multiple languages. That's why I asked this question. Also, what about a translator coming in? Um, sure. How does that work? So every translation is an effort to to carry the intent of the original author to somebody in a different language. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, every translator makes mistakes. I have also, I may have also made mistakes, and if I come to know, I'll definitely correct in the next edition. But uh, the more you know, the both the source language and the target language, the better you are at the translation. So, okay. uh, and and specifically when translating from Sanskrit, a highly structured language, a highly mathematical language with uh, rules of compound and sandhi, which allow us to interpret a text in multiple ways and words which can be derived from root words 
by an algebra like process yeah it's it's all the more important to know the structure of the language the grammar of the language uh yeah. especially in sanskrit for example let's say if you're targeting shakespeare into hindi right now now when he says a custom more honored in the breach than in the observance or when he when he talks about uh, uh, the most unkindest cut of all yeah how would he translate that in hindi because shakespeare when he yeah. says the most unkindest cut of all if you yeah. look at it it's a grammatical mistake but he has said yeah. the most unkindest cut uh, yeah. and to get words which have a similar force of expression in hindi it's challenging uh, yeah. so one has to know both languages well you know so yeah. like krurtam aghat or something like which carries the force of the expression uh, right. so that's uh, one has to know the source language and target language really well and when yeah. translating from sanskrit especially sanskrit grammar uh, and uh, that's uh, one has to read commentaries at times for example for this book yeah. as i have written in the preface i have uh, relied at many places on the commentary by nilakantha who was uh, uh, a scholar of maharashtrian origins lived in right. uh, varanasi if i am not mistaken and wrote a commentary on the entire mahabharata uh, he has left some portions but it's the okay. only full commentary uh, published on the mahabharata and at many places where the original text has words which can be interpreted in multiple ways this is especially in sanskrit where a word or expression can be interpreted in multiple ways uh, or where it's not very clear or it's pregnant with deep meanings i have taken the commentary of nilkanth as my uh, guiding light so as to say which is what even other translators have done uh, for example if you read the free translation of the mahabharata by kesari mohan ganguly if you yeah. read his notes uh, yeah. so often he says this is what the commentator has said which i feel feel is correct at some places he also says this what the comment this is how the commentator nilkanth explains these words but i think the sense is different here and right. sometimes he criticizes the burdwan edition of the mahabharata and says uh, this edition says this but it's entirely wrong as the commentator has explained it is that that is the sense so yeah. we take these as we take previous translations uh, or previous commentaries as a guiding light at times so even i have referred to the geeta press translation which uh, is in hindi and yeah. the translation by uh, kesari mohan ganguly at times i have been immensely benefited by them to to see how other people have translated a similar expression or a phrase uh, i have taken them as my guiding light wonderful um, i mean it's time to kind of conclude the session but before that it's the book nerds podcast uh, we would need some book recommendations from you of course this one is already there uh, how would you like to consume uh, how would you like the reader to consume this like uh go for it like a stand alone or also read around it what would you recommend yes so my my recommendation would be uh start with the the stories and then the fables which interest you more maybe okay. read the context in the mahabharat so you can refer either the uh, translation by kesari mohan ganguly or vivek debroy or manmath nath dat or the hindi translation by geeta press uh, so yes. the fables which you think uh the fables which come across as uh, very forceful or very deep to you i'd recommend read around and that's why the context helps so read around uh, the fables uh, in the uh, mahabharata or a translation and also uh do compare these to isaps fables panchatantra hitopadesha and the jatakas because a lot of uh, fables have common source as uh, one of the books by kavathekar tells that uh, yeah. many of these isaps fables his thesis is that they originated from india and went all the way oh. to greece so yeah. just like the fable of the three fish it's in the hitopadesha it's in the panchatantra the fable yeah. of the birds the birds yeah. and the bird hunter very interesting where in the panchatantra and hitopadesha edition uh, the birds fly away with the net and the and the bird hunter cannot do anything but in the mahabharata edition the birds when they are flying they fight in the air and then they 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 all fall down and the hunter catches them so this is an interesting lesson on both unity and disunity that unity is strength but a fragile unity is not strength so uh, 
Yes, uh, I would say you could read this in any way, in any sequence you want. And yeah. the fables which interest you more, you can read about them uh, in the translations of the Mahabharata. Well, time has just flown. Uh, we, I, I could not even get to the five life forces, which I loved so much. And uh, there are so many, there are 51 fables, right? 51 fables. Yes, 51. And, yeah, there are so many guys, uh, you need to experience them. It's an experience. I won't even call it a book, to be honest. It's an experience. If you, if you read them, you can read like five per sitting also. You know, it doesn't have to be at one go. So you can do that with this book, which is a unique experience these days. Uh, and uh, we know, I mean, uh, we have lesser time, but you need to get, uh, to, if you read the book, you'll understand what I mean. I don't want to say much, but you will not regret this. That That's something I, I can tell you right away. And thank you so much, Nityaran. It's, it's been a pleasure. Uh, you know, we love to read all genres, but this genre, when it comes to this genre, you know, I, I've been reading a lot in this genre, but uh, one of the finest, like top, you know, notch. Thank you so much for writing this. And we look forward to so much more from you. And also we need to go back and read the rest of your books. Uh, can Thank you recommend you. Us, what, us one after this? Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, I think one of my finest books is the Om Mala which is a, a book only on one word, which is Om. Uh, and wow. there I have summarized uh, uh, views from many diverse texts, like the Vedic texts, the Upanishads, uh, the Bhagavad Gita, the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, the Puranic texts, the yogic texts, like Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, and uh, uh, Kalidasa's uh, Raghuvamsha, and so on. So uh, it's... Uh, it's a book on one word, and that's what makes it unique. And it's also yeah. styled like a mala or a rosary, which uh, people chant right. on. So it's 108, 109 sections to be precise. And Andy, each yes. section is a uh, typeset such that you don't need to turn a page to understand one beat or one. Oh. Yeah. Wow. So as, as you mentioned, I'm a book designer. All of my books, I typeset myself. Uh, okay. In fact, when I speak with the publisher, I... I even specify. I, I even talk about what's the bleed needed and what's what's uh, do. Do you need crop marks or not? So, were they cool about it? Bloomsbury uh, must have had a hard time. They will would be like, oh my God, Mr. Misra has come now. He'll gri I'm, grill us about the typesetting. <laughs> I'm I'm the perhaps the only author who does this for them. Uh, I I'm have sure never met I have never met met any author who does this. Trust it's me, like, I have <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know. Uh, I think I think I love the process of typesetting books. So yeah. it's like Charlie Chaplin. Uh, if you look at some of his movies, uh, like uh, The Circus or uh, you know The Tramp, yeah, he he was the music director. He produced the movie. He acted in it because he yeah. loved this art so much. So I love. Uh, I'm just so passionate about writing and typesetting a book that I want I want the reader to experience exactly what I want them to experience. For example, I don't want a word to break in my text or I don't want a space after any of the three, let, three one letter words in English which is A, I and O, the vocative O. So right. I control that using my LaTeX software where to break, where to break the page, where to break the line. In examples uh, in my other books, uh, you won't find a verse printed with one line on one page and the next line on the other page. So yeah. all of that, uh, I, I absolutely love typesetting books and uh, we can have perhaps one more session on typesetting books. You know? <laughs> oh yes, I, I, I have not mentioned this because this project of ours is in stealth mode. So I have not mentioned this, but I am going to email you regarding this because <laughs> sure. it, is, it sounds so interesting. And uh, yeah, I I am just take blown away to be honest. And this five I, I, can, I can I can explain the parts of a hardcover dust jacket. Oh what is wow! That? What wow. is this? What is that? What's how is a book printed? And even the publishing industry. I did run a publishing house also at one oh, point in time. So I I didn't want to ask you because I thought okay, <laughs> I think either he has done it or he will do it. 
So I uh, will <laughs> will you know leave it at that because I sure. will look forward to the sequel to this interaction and it won't be an interaction it would be something much more interesting without me so i i really hope so that happens and we'll get to you i uh, will email you the details thank you so much for doing thank this you all. it was a pleasure it is just you know we are uh, touching the surface with you here but thank you so much for being on the book nerds podcast looking forward to you know so much more i leave the link to this book uh, to to vyas katha in the comments guys do buy it leave a review on amazon it always helps the author and if you have time go grab it from an independent bookstore uh, where is it available uh, nitin where, uh, where can they find it uh, in a book, book stores i am not sure i did uh, there's a mo- what's that mall in noida there's a, a crossword uh, G- it's available at crossword gip gip or dlf dlf i i think gip i think gip the okay. great indian okay. something Um, yes, 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 yes. Great India yeah. place. Yeah. Great India place. Uh, so crossword. I think there's a crossword store there. A reader sent me a photo, so it should be available at crosswords, Amazon, yeah. and Flipkart. It's it's there. The Kindle edition is also available in English. The Kindle edition for Hindi is going to come out soon. So yeah. uh, just request your uh, bookstore to get it if you don't have it. If they don't. Sure, have sir. It. So we'll we'll uh, tell Bloomsbury to send some books to Dehradun also. I think I saw it uh, at Select City Walk. I I don't. Uh, it was I, I, it was at Varanasi Airport also. So uh, airports will have it. Uh, major bookstores yeah. should have it. If they're not carrying, then you can just request them to get it. Awesome! Thank you so much. It has been such a pleasure, uh, a totally educational experience for me. Reading the book and talking to you, it can't Thank get you. better. This weekend can't get better. Uh, I need to close the session now. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. <laughs>